APCO Educational Topic Number 8, Maternal Fetal Physiology. This is the story of Peggy Preggers and the physiologic changes that occur in her body throughout her pregnancy. A lot happens to the female body in order to create a new human being. The objectives of this video are to discuss the maternal physiologic and anatomic changes associated with pregnancy, describe fetal and placental physiology, and lastly, interpret common diagnostic studies during pregnancy. There are a lot of changes that occur in each of the three trimesters of pregnancy. Remember that we use menstrual dating when calculating the weeks. Here is our trusty pregnancy wheel, and from the first day of her last menstrual period, we calculate the estimated date of delivery, or EDD, as 40 weeks after the LMP. So the first trimester is approximately 0 to 13 weeks, the second trimester is approximately 14 to 27 weeks, and the third trimester is approximately 28 to 40 weeks. We will discuss changes in the pregnant body by system and how these changes occur in the three different trimesters. There are changes in thyroid regulation during pregnancy. Remember that beta HCG levels peak at 100,000 around 10 weeks and then come down to about 10,000 at term. Beta-HCG has thyrotropin-like activity, and this stimulates maternal thyroxine, or T4, secretion, and thus produces a transient rise in free T4 levels in the first trimester. As beta-HCG levels decline, free T4 levels decline to normal concentrations. Rising levels of estrogen in pregnancy cause an increase in thyroxine-binding globulin, which results in increased levels of total T4 and total T3, but levels of free T4 and free T3 are unchanged from the normal range. Let's now move to the GI system. Here is Peggy in her first trimester with her small developing pregnancy and her corpus luteum is making large volumes of progesterone. As the pregnancy progresses past the first trimester, the placenta will take over as the main source of progesterone production. Progesterone relaxes smooth muscles throughout the body and in the GI system, the progesterone will relax the lower esophageal sphincter tone, which can result in gastroesophageal reflux disease or GERD. Progesterone also reduces gallbladder contractility, which leads to an increased prevalence of gallstones. Progesterone also decreases GI motility, which can cause constipation. In the first trimester, many women experience nausea and vomiting. The term morning sickness is not very accurate, for many women experience it throughout the day. Approximately 50 to 90 percent of women experience nausea and vomiting in the first trimester. The cause is unknown, but is thought to be related to elevated levels of progesterone and beta-HCG. Severe nausea and vomiting in pregnancy is referred to as hyperemesis gravidarum and can result in significant weight loss, ketonemia, and electrolyte imbalance. In the second trimester, as the beta-HCG levels decline, nausea and vomiting tends to improve and for most women it has abated by about 14 to 16 weeks. As the uterus grows throughout the second and third trimester, the stomach is physically displaced upwards by the growing uterus and this also contributes to GERD during pregnancy. Let's move now to the cardiovascular system. The female body essentially needs more volume to support the growing pregnancy. The circulating blood volume begins increasing by week 6 to 8 and reaches a peak increase of 45% by 32 weeks. The heart essentially needs to work harder during pregnancy. Cardiac output increases by 30 to 50% with 50% of that increase occurring by 8 weeks. Remember that cardiac output equals heart rate times stroke volume. In the first half of pregnancy, cardiac output increases are secondary to increased stroke volume. In the second half of pregnancy, cardiac output increases are secondary to increased heart rate. There is a decrease in blood pressure during pregnancy secondary to progesterone smooth muscle relaxing effects and increased production of vasodilatory substances from the growing placenta. Supine postural hypotension syndrome refers to the hypotension that pregnant women experience when laying flat on their backs. Late in pregnancy, as the uterus grows, it can impede the vena cava when a woman is supine. This is why we advise women not to lay flat on their backs while sleeping, and instead recommend sleeping with a left tilt or on their side. And remember, as the uterus grows, it gets more of cardiac output, so by the end of pregnancy, it gets 20% of cardiac output as opposed to 2% of cardiac output in the first trimester. Moving on to the respiratory system. Oxygen consumption increases during pregnancy, Minute ventilation, which is defined as the volume of air that is taken in every minute, increases by 30 to 40 percent. This increase in ventilation results in an increased production of CO2, which results in a reduction of arterial PCO2 or a development of a respiratory alkalosis. This is balanced by the kidney excreting more bicarbonate, which yields the lower bicarbonate level seen in pregnancy. An arterial blood gas in pregnancy will show a compensated respiratory alkalosis with a normal pH. The maternal thorax undergoes several morphological changes during pregnancy. 
The diaphragm is elevated an impressive 4 centimeters by late pregnancy due to the gravid uterus. In addition, the subcostal angle widens as the chest diameter and circumference increase slightly. Moving on to the hematologic system, remember that the circulating volume increases by 45 to 50 percent by the third trimester of pregnancy. The red cell volume also increases, although to a lesser extent than the plasma volume. The maternal blood volume increases by 35 percent at term. This creates a physiologic anemia. At term, the average hemoglobin concentration is 12.5 compared to 14 in the non-pregnant state. Supplemental iron during pregnancy is thus intended to prevent further iron deficiency. The concentration of different clotting factors change during pregnancy. Fibrinogen levels increase by 50%, protein C and protein S levels decrease, and the risk of thromboembolism doubles during pregnancy and increases to 5.5 times the normal risk during the immediate postpartum time. How do all of these changes manifest on examination of Peggy Preggers? First, expect to see low blood pressures. Blood pressures start to decline by week 7 and reach a maximal decline by weeks 24 to 26 weeks. It is also common to see distended neck veins from the increased volume of pregnancy. Pregnant women often also have a low-grade systolic ejection murmur secondary to increased flow across the aortic and pulmonic valves. Note a diastolic murmur is not normal in pregnancy and should be evaluated. Let's now switch gears and discuss fetal and placental physiology. Here is a cross-section of the umbilical cord with two umbilical arteries and one umbilical vein. Remember that blood flows from the umbilical vein to the fetus and then from the fetus through the two umbilical arteries. So blood flows from the umbilical vein to the portal system. And here, 50% of the blood goes to the right lobe of the liver, and 50% of the blood goes through this first shunt of pregnancy called the ductus venosus into the inferior vena cava. So here's blood going through the ductus venosus into the inferior vena cava. There, the blood travels to the right atrium. So here is the heart with the right atrium, the right ventricle, the left atrium, and the left ventricle. The second shunt of pregnancy is the foramen ovale, and some of the blood will go from the right atrium to the left atrium to the left ventricle and then into the aorta. Some blood goes from the right atrium to the right ventricle and then into the pulmonary arteries. The third shunt of pregnancy is the ductus arteriosus. So blood will go from the pulmonary arteries through this ductus arteriosus into the aorta. The blood then goes from the aorta down to the common iliacs and then from the common iliacs, there are the internal iliacs, which then branch to the umbilical arteries back to the placenta. So remember that it is oxygenated blood that flows from the umbilical vein. I'm going to represent this in red. It goes from the umbilical vein through the first shunt of the ductus venosus up through the second shunt of the foramen ovale, and then through the third shunt of the ductus arteriosus. I'm going to represent the blood flow now in purple to represent that it's mixing with deoxygenated blood. And then at the end of the circuit, I'll change to blue to represent the fully deoxygenated blood. What happens in the placenta? Here's the umbilical cord, and then here's the placenta. The placenta is a unique organ of pregnancy, for it is partially fetal and partially maternal. We'll call this top part the fetal portion and the bottom portion the maternal portion. The simplest way to think about this system is that the placenta has pools of maternal blood. So here are the pools of maternal blood. And the fetus inserts its capillaries into these pools of maternal blood. Trophoblastic cells help with this invasion process. It is at these sites of intersection of fetal and maternal tissues that oxygen and excretion of CO2 cross the placenta by simple diffusion. Glucose and amino acids are other solutes that are transferred from the mother to the fetus at these sites. 
Thus, we conclude the video about Peggy Preggers and the amazing changes that occur throughout the three trimesters of her pregnancy. We have discussed the maternal physiologic and anatomic changes associated with pregnancy, the associated physical exam and diagnostic study changes during this time, as well as fetal and placental physiology. Thank <laughs> you.